Section 20 of the Algonquin Legends of New England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly. The Algonquin Legends of New England or Myths and Folklore of the Micmac, Passamaquoddy and Penobscot Tribes by Charles Godfrey Leland. Section 20. The Merry Tales of Lox the Mischief Maker, commonly known as the Indian Devil. Now the two brothers went on till they came to the top of a high mountain, where there lay a very great round rock or mighty boulder, and being full of fun, they turned it over with great sticks, saying to it, Now let us run a race. Then it rolled downhill till it stopped at the foot, and they rushing along by it all the time, and when it rested they jeered it, and bade it race with them again when it so listed. And truly they had not long to wait, for soon after, as they sat cooking their food, they heard a mighty commotion as of something coming with dreadful speed through the forest, and lo, it was the stone in dire wrath, which, having rested a little while, came rushing through the forest, crashing the mighty trees like grass, with a roar like thunder, leaving a smooth road behind it in the roughest wilderness. Up and after the sorcerers flew the stone, and the younger slipped aside like a snake. But the elder had scarcely time to utter his magic charm. Nugun uskudiskush! Let my backbone remain uninjured. Ere the awful rock rolled down upon him, and crushing his bones and mashing his flesh, yet the spine was unhurt. It remained sound as ever and the stone went on and ever on, till the sound of its roar died away in the breeze and afar in the wilderness. And then the younger brother turned to the backbone and said, Kagui wejismut tumun, why are you lying there? And hearing this charm, the bone called aloud, Natenin baho, my body ho, and nulugun la ho, my leg ho, and so with the rest of the members as before until he that was decomposed was now recomposed. Yes, and composed perfectly. And then he that was dead, but was now alive, arose, and said as one awaking, What have I been doing? So his brother told him all. And then he was greatly angered, and when the wolverine is angry, it's not a little. And he said in his wrath, Shall I that am the devil of the woods himself be slain by birds and stones, and not be revenged? So they went onwards through the woods till they found the great rock. They followed in the path of the broken trees. Even by the trees did they track it. Which having found, they built a fire around it. With great stones for hammers they broke it, and ever more and still smaller, till it was all mere dust, for their souls were sore for revenge. When lo, a great wonder, for the spirit of the old rock, even that which was itself, turned all the dust to black flies, into the stinging and evil things which drive men and beasts mad, so that its hatred and spite might be carried out on all living creatures unto the end of time. And having had their ill will of the rock, and seen it become flies, the two went through the forest, and so on till they came to a village of good, honest folk. And knowing what manner of men they were, Lox resolved to forthwith play them an evil trick for in all life there was nothing half so dear to him as to make mischief, the worse the better. And this time it came into his head that it would be a fine piece of wit to go into the town as a gay girl and get married and see what would come of it, trusting to luck to fashion a sad fool out of somebody. So having made himself into a delicate young beauty, richly attired, he entered the place. And truly the town was soon agog over the new guests, and the young chief of the tribe, wanting her, won her without waste of time. Truly there lieth herein some mystery, I know not what, only this I know, that there are in all towns certain folk, who by means of magic or meddling, always find out everything about everybody, and then tittle-tattle thereof. Now, albeit Lox had utterly abjured all the sinfulness of manhood, and had made a new departure in an utterly new direction, saying not a word thereof to any one, yet in a brief measure of time, one here, another there, Jack in a corner and Jane by the bush, began to whisper of a strange thing and hint that all was not as it should be, 
and whatever the chief might think, that in their minds matters were going wrong in his wigwam. Now Lox, knowing all this thread, as soon as it was spun, began to think it high time to show his hand in the game, and what was the amazement of all the town to hear, one fine evening, that the chief's wife would soon be a mother, and when the time came, Dame Lox informed her husband that, according to the custom of her people, she must be left utterly alone till he was a father and the babe born. And when in due time the cry of a small child was heard in the lodge, the women waiting ran in and received from the mother the little one, abundantly rolled in many wrappers, which they took to the chief. But what was his amazement when, having unrolled the package, he found under one skin after another, tied up hard, yet another sewed up, and yet again, as the inmost kernel of this nut, the little withered, wizened, dead, and dried shrivelment of an unborn moose-calf, which pleased the chief so much that, dashing Master Moose into the fire, he seized his tomahawk and ran to his lodge to make his first morning call on the mother. But Master Lox was now a man again, and expecting this call, and not wishing to see visitors, had with his brother fled to the woods, and that rapidly. And in the rush he came to a river, and seeing a very high waterfall, thought of a rare device whereby he might elude pursuit. For he with his brother soon built a dam across the top with trees and earth, so that but little water went below, and lying in a cave concealed with care, he imitated the boo-oo-oo of a falling stream with quaint and wondrous skill, and there he lay, and no man wist thereof. But verily the wicked one is caught in his own snare, and even so it befell Master Lox, for as he hid the water above, having gathered to a great lake, burst the dam, and so that it all came down upon him, and at once drowned him. Nor was there any great weeping for him that ever I heard of. So here he passes out of this story, and does not come into it again, but whether he went for good and all out of this life is doubtful, since I find him living again in so many rare, strange histories that it has become a proverb that Lox never dies. Now the tale returns to the two little weasels, or ermines, or water-maids, poor souls, who had such a hard life, and it happened that, fleeing from Master Lox, they came at evening to a deserted village, and entered a wigwam to pass the night. But the elder, being the wiser, and somewhat of a witch in the bud, mistrusted the place, deeming it not so empty as it seemed. And beholding by the door, lying on the ground, the neck-bone of a man or some other animal, she warned her sister that she should in no wise offend it or treat it lightly, to which the younger replied by giving it a kick which sent it flying, and by otherwise treating it with scorn and disdain. Then they laid them down to sleep, but before their slumber came they heard a doleful, bitter voice chanting aloud and shouting, and it was Chamach Kegwetch, or the neckbone, bewailing the scorn that had been put upon him and reviling them with all manner of curses. Then the elder said, I knew you would be our death if you did not mind me, it being in all cases an esteemed solace for every woman and most men to say, I told you so. But the younger, being well nigh frightened to a corpse, in a soft whisper implored the elder to let her hide herself in her roll of hair, which the voice mocking her repeated, adding thereto all the reviling and railing that Michihant the devil himself ever yet invented and abusing her so for her past life, and exhorting her so for all the sins, slips, and slops therein, of which there were many, that even the impenitent little weasel repented and wept bitterly. Howbeit, no further harm came to them beyond this, so that the next morning they went their way in peace, and I warrant you Master Neckbone got no kicks that day from them, departing. Then, coming to a river, they saw on the other side a handsome young man holding a bow, and to him they called, making their usual offer to become his wives, and all for no greater thing than to carry them over the ferry. And this man's name was Sea Witch, and to please them he did indeed pass them over in his canoe. But as for taking them home, he said that he had housekeepers in store, and as many as he needed just then, and that of a kind who kept him very busy. So they went their way onwards. And coming anon to the great sea, 
they beheld yet another canoe with two men therein, and these were Quemu the loon and Marguis the scapegrace. And embarking with them, loon soon began to admire the girls greatly, and saying many sweet things, he told them that he dwelt in the Wigham territory, or in the land of Awilkesk, of which he himself was one. But the Marguis whispered to them aside, that they should put little trust in what he told them, for Loon was a great liar. Now, when they came to the land of the Awilkesk, they were amazed at the beauty of the people, and saw that all in that land was lovely, nor did they themselves seem less marvellously fair to the men therein. Indeed, the poor little weasels began to see the end of their sorrows, for being water fairies, these sea-birds were nigh akin to them, and there was a great feast, a great dance, and great games held in honour of their arrival. And the two finest young sea-duck men, utterly unheeding the old loon, who believed indeed that they were his own wives, carried them off, and nothing loath wedded them. And it was in this wise. There was a canoe race, and Quemu, being bitterly angry that he was held of so little account in the sea-duck land, went forth with the rest, and paddling far outside, upset his canoe, and making as if he were drowned, calling to the weasels to come and save him. But the sea-ducks laughed, and said, Let him alone, truly he will never drown, we know him. And the race ended, and they went ashore in peace. And that night they danced late, and the weasels, being better pleased with the two handsome sea-ducks than with Loon, forthwith divorced themselves out of hand, and at once married them, going to where their canoe lay to pass the bridal night. Now Loon had not gone to the dance, but sat at home nursing his vengeance, till he was well nigh mad. And as the weasels did not return, he went forth and sought them, and this he did so carefully, that at last he found all four by the sea, sound asleep. Whereupon he, with his knife, slew the young men, and being in great fear of their friends, took his canoe and went down the river to kill a deer. But not daring to return, and being mad for loss of the weasels, and fearing to fall into the hands of the enemy, he in despair took his knife and killed himself. Yet the weasels who had seen the deed done did not betray him, for there was at least so much truth left in them, and they lived with the sea-ducks, and I doubt me not went on marrying and mischief-making after their wont, even unto the end of their days, and their kind are not dead as yet in any land. This is a fair specimen of many Indian legends. So much of it as is Micmac was told to Mr. Rand by a highly intelligent Indian named Benjamin Brooks, who was certain that the story was of great antiquity. As I at first heard it, it was limited to the adventure with the stars, but I was told that this formed only a part of an extremely long narrative. It consists, in fact, of different parts of other tales connected, and I doubt not that there is much more of it. It cannot escape the reader versed in fairy lore that the incident of the water maiden captured by her clothes is common to all European nations, but that it is especially Norse, while the adventures of the Wolverine, and indeed his whole character, are strangely suggestive of Loki, the spirit of mere mischief who becomes evil. The fact that both Loki and Lox end their earthly career at a waterfall is very curious. The two also become, in wizard fashion, women at will. But it is chiefly in the extreme and wanton devilishness of their tricks that they are alike. Many other resemblances will suggest themselves to those who knew the Edas. In the Passamaquoddy version of this tale, it is Sea Witch and not the Loon who plays the part of the jealous husband at the end. The career of the weasel seemed to set forth the adventures of a couple of Indian Becky Sharps, very much in the spirit of an Indian Thackeray. The immorality of these damsels, the sponging of Martin, the deviltry of Lox, the senile follies and ferocious vindictiveness of the loon, all seem to impress the composer of the tale as so many bubbles rising and falling on the sea of life, only remarkable for the sun-gleam of humour which they reflect. Outside these tales I know of nothing which so resembles the inner spirit of Aristophanes, Rabelais and Shakespeare. I do not say that the genius of these great masters is in them, but their manner of seeing humour and wickedness combined. The cause of this lies in the cultivated stoicism with which every Indian trains himself to regard life, 
the inevitable result of such culture is always in some way a kind of humour either grim or gay a reperusal of the Eddas has impressed me with the remarkable resemblance of Locke's The Wolverine to Loki. The story begins with the incident of a bird maiden caught by a trick and married. This is distinctly Scandinavian. It is known in all lands, but the Norse made the most of it. Then the two girls sit and choose the kind of stars they will have. In the Eskimo, two girls sitting on a beach, talking in the same way, seeing eagles and whales bones by them, declare that they would like to marry, the one an eagle, the other a whale, and both get their wishes. In the Norse legends, stars are like human beings. Lox is pursued by a giant bird. Loki is chased by Thiassi, the giant in eagle plumage. Again, in the Edda, a great eagle drags and trails Loki over woods and mountains until he screams for pity. The wolverine's race with the stone giant also recalls this race, the eagle being really one of the Jotuns who were also all mountains and rocks. The wolverine wizard becomes a girl, merely to make mischief. Loki took the form of a woman in Fensal, where he schemed to kill Balder. This is certainly a strange coincidence, for as in the Edda, Loki's becoming a woman led to all the subsequent tragedy and to his own doom. So, in the Indian tale, the very same thing caused the wolverine to be chased to the high waterfall, where, owing to his own tricks, he perished, just as Loki came to grief in Franangur's Fours, the bright and glistening cataract. But the most remarkable point is that the general immoral character of Lox, or wolverine, is so much like that of Loki, consisting of evil or mischief of the worst kind, always tempered by humour which provokes a laugh. Now, to find a similar and very singular character supported by several coincidences is, if nothing more, at least very remarkable. Loki is fire, and Lox, when killed in another tale, is revived by heat. He is carried off by the Kalu, or cloud, and let fall, typifying fire or lightning coming from a cloud. Again, in another story, he dies for want of fire, and he twice dies by drowning, that is, the fire is quenched by water. In one of the Passamaquoddy versions of this tale, which is, though less detailed, far superior in humour to the Micmac, the loon is cheated by his two nephews, the Asuis, a species of loon, who steal the weasels from him. He revenges himself not by murdering, but by merely frightening them. He fills a bladder with blood, puts it under his shirt, and then stabs himself. They, thinking he is killed, lament, when he grandly comes to life, and is regarded as a great magician. End of section 20